I'm delighted to be here today with Perry Marshall and Glenn Ruschling um, to talk about this terrific book, Evolution 2.0, that Perry wrote. And uh, just as a little intro, uh, Perry has a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Nebraska. He's a business consultant, entrepreneur, and the kind of inventor of the Evolution 2.0 $10 million prize for anyone who can discover a spontaneously arising communication system. And uh, I had another episode with Perry, which I will link to in the description section. And uh, Glenn is a regular here on The Meaning Code. He and I have done a series of six episodes on the physics of life and a number of others on information and the whole idea of code. So I thought it would be a good idea to get the two of these together. Glenn is a physicist, a mathematician, and a computer engineer, and uh, I think a, a communicator extraordinaire. So um, <laughs> to get started today, um, Glenn had given me some ideas of things that he had watched episodes of yours, Perry, and he's also read your book. So um, in one of the episodes that you did, Perry, with um, the Unbelievable podcast, there's a point at which you make the statement that there is origin of life versus origin of species. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't really get a chance to expand on that. And I, so I wondered if you'd like to expand on that here as a way to kind of springboard our conversation. Well, I think uh, most scientists see those as being entirely different questions because the narrative that you're always uh, told is that well, you know, once Darwinian evolution gets started, it, it, you know, it, it, it'll just go and go and go and everything gets better and better and better. But uh, that's, well, it, your, your car sitting in your garage doesn't get better and your computer sitting on your desk doesn't get better. Um, and, and, you know, nothing in the non-living world gets better all by itself. But for some reason, living things do. And it's not because of mutation and selection. It's because living things have the ability to generate new information, which is, um, I, I, I proved in a paper that I published a year and a half ago, I proved that that's a cognitive process. And so that means the origin of information uh, is a question that's necessary uh, to answer in, in order to even understand how we get species. And I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean understand that we get new species. I mean understand how. Uh, I think we've barely even gotten started in biology. In fact, I think biology as a field is still in its infancy. And the most fundamental questions are not, not only not answered, but they're swept under the rug and we pretend that we know the answers when we really don't. And so I think uh, origin of uh, species, origin of information, cognition, cancer, AI are all one question, which is where does information come from? Mm -hmm. Well, I sort of focused on that conference, the conversation you had between um, you and uh, Steve and Meyer. Yeah. I thought that was a good, a lot of good places to start from. And uh, for, for two reasons, being a Christian, I've always had to deal with the physics versus faith. Uh, it's an existential kind of crisis that you live with. And I felt I know also I'm against, I'm uncomfortable with the intelligent design arguments, even as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things that sparked me <clears throat> when I started to get into you. I was trying to figure you out at first. And I thought, oh, wait a second. So he's a Christian, but he's also not comfortable either. And I thought I was a lone voice. So it was nice to, that was probably one of the first things that, that hooked me in. Mm. <clears throat> And I think when you're, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when these intelligent design arguments come up, they focus on the 
the origins of species side and information comes in and they leave out the fact that something had to start it all to begin with. And that that is one of the, the, the hard nuts to crack that the intelligent design argument doesn't really address. Unless you believe that some outside agent just came in and magically mixed the chemicals up and then as in the, you know the, the Sistine Chapel, you know, the, the touch and made it happen. So um, and I think it it helps focus on that your challenge is really an origin of life question. So how does it spark up to begin with to start with? And um, one of the, as an engineer, I've, I had a chance to work in a number of startup uh, situations and I worked for a contract engineering house, um, actually a couple for, in medical device technology for a while. So I'm, I'm used to this situation where someone comes in with an idea and it's, they don't know what to do with it. Um, in the case of doctors, they might be a specialist. They're, they're treating and they say, you know, it would be great if we just had something that would do this. And then they come into the, you know, the, the company, the, the, the partners and the managers will have a little meeting with them. And then they kind of go back and forth. What can we do, what we can't? And then they put together a team of engineers, which is where I would come in. So if a medical device had to have a little embedded computer in it or something, you know, sensors, uh, actuators, any kind of electromechanical, I would get drug in on it. And then there'd be more meetings back and forth where you're talking to the client, trying to say, okay, what do you want? Well, this is what we can do. And I always thought that moment when the first prototype shows up on the lab bench, and it's usually a big mess with mm -hmm. wires going everywhere, and, <clears throat> and it just works and you go, okay, we've got it. Now we can start step by step going from there. So that's how I always see the, the split. There's that one question, where does that idea come from in the first place? And Karen, you touched on it with the Mozart example. The idea comes out of nothing. <laughs> where does, yeah, it's the question of information has to become physical. There's that one moment. And then there's, once it's there, then there's sets of rules. That's why you go to engineering school or <clears throat> training. And then you know, once you have something, there are methods, there's techniques. Okay, we're gonna modify this, we can add to that. And I kind of see that as your, your Swiss army knife, your five steps that you're saying, okay, once we have it, we've got all these tools now that we can keep working and modifying until we get the beta. And I think, <clears throat> When I was listening to Stephen Meyer, I think he's missing that aspect of what you're trying to say. You don't need necessarily new information being fed in. Once you've got something started, there are steps that back and forth, cut and paste, you know, swapping code, hybridization. Am I getting you right in a sense? Yeah, so engineers, have an experience of how the medical device comes into existence. And that experience trumps anybody's theory about, you know, there's scientists tend to do analysis. They don't design things. Mm -hmm. And they often don't appreciate how much ingenuity and struggle and brainstorming and experimentation and affordances and you know all those things that happen and and so like you're definitely speaking my language because it sounds like we've both done a lot of almost identical things mm -hmm. um and and so uh so an engineer naturally looks at uh a cell or an organism as a piece of engineering and I think Richard Dawkins validated that when he said, biology is the study of things that appear to be designed. <laughs> okay, there's, there's no getting around the implicit intentionality and the ingenuity 
uh, of what there is. Well, so I went down the rabbit hole uh, of, of this whole topic 18 years ago. And uh, I was quite sympathetic with a lot of what the intelligent design guys were saying. And a lot of those people are engineers mm -hmm. and they make a lot of valid uh, observations and they ask a lot of good questions and they do a lot of good scholarship and they don't get taken nearly as seriously as they deserve to. They, they kind of, they, they get discriminated against very actively, but there was always something that didn't quite sit right with me. And it was the question of, so how many supernatural interventions are we talking about here? Um, are we talking about zero as in design is somehow in the fabric of the universe uh, waiting to be expressed? Or is there like one divine intervention, like the first cell and then you know, and then everything goes from there, or is it a whole series of, of speciation events? Like, well, God wasn't around most of the time, but then he showed up during the Cambrian explosion, or is it like God is always like injecting information in there and, and you could frame it all of those different ways. And, and all of those would be intelligent design. Um, and uh, one of the problems, I think, is that intelligent design is a very big tent. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are people who are six-day young earth creationists who believe the world was made 6,000 years ago. Um, and they read all those books, and that's what they read into it. And there are other people that there aren't even religious, or maybe they're just a deist or something like that, but they believe that there is some kind of a very purposeful um, thing that's being expressed in biology. And when I looked at what does a scientist have to actually do to make a living? And what does a scientist have to do to discover something that's worthwhile and useful to humanity, including things useful for engineering? Um, framing intelligent design as a series of miracles doesn't help very much mm -hmm. and I, I saw that it's inherently desirable to have as few miraculous events in your account of history as you could possibly get away with uh, because every every insertion of a miraculous event is therefore something where there's no further human discovery that could be made. And, and I just saw that as being counterproductive. And so way before I ever wrote the book, I kind of had to decide, well, how am I going to frame this? And how can I frame this so that any scientist who's trying to do his job is going to find this useful and constructive instead of obstructing the process of science? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> well, I was, oh, yeah. I was just, just going to bring up a couple of quotes from your book, Perry, because I think they fit right here. And then, then Glenn can respond too. that um, on page 197, you say any theory of evolution is a theory of how information gets created. And then on the next page, you said the origin of information is a fundamental scientific question that deserves an answer. And I think that goes to your point here about if you, if you posit too many miraculous events, then science stops because there's no point in pursuing it any further. But the, the materialists have done the same thing basically here because they don't, they don't want to pursue this question because right. they don't know where it's going to lead. And so that also stops science going down that pathway, right? Yes. Um, and in fact, I, I came to feel that both sides were obstructing the process of, uh, process of science vigorously. Yeah. Um, I, I, I felt like, well, you know, the random mutation selfish gene theory is just uh, one um, indecipherable miracle after another, after another, after another. Uh, that doesn't even follow the structure of a proper scientific theory. 
Uh, and then the intelligent design, like the, the creationist, because intelligent design means a lot of things, but like the interventionist creationist version is a different series of miracles. So you have, you have a secular miracle versus a theological miracle, neither of which is science. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and, and once I really understood that, I couldn't unsee it. It, it actually took me a while. Uh, to grasp what the problem was. Um, I was talking to my brother, you know, who figures very prominently in this whole thing from the very beginning. And once I started getting traction and I was making arguments successfully and defending myself in atheist forums, I'm, I'm telling my brother about this and he goes, well, Perry, what do you expect scientists to do? Just throw up their hands and say, God did it. There you have it, Perry. You, you answered the question. We're never going to figure this out. Is that what you want him to do? And it got me to realize I'm, I've learned how to make a God of the gaps argument very effectively, but what did it really buy me? Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep going. If I can get, keep my voice there. Um, one of the, the notions about information coming in, somehow it has to become physical. And being a hardware designer guy, I work down at the you know, physical, you know, lowercase p level. And if information is coming in and becoming physical, there has to be a mechanism somewhere in, in the system where information is showing up and then getting read out and inserted and there has to be read writes or there has to be a whole chunk of hardware there to do it. And I, the intelligent design like Stephen Meyer, they don't address that. If, if, the, if you're going to suggest that information is coming in, you also have to point to the mechanism at the physical layer where it's coming in from. And, you know, that's not there. I don't see that their arguments include that at all. So. But that's also the flip side is if you want to know where it's coming in, if you can analyze the system, see where that's happening and then sort of trace the wire back and see where it's coming from. And it, it might just be the wire goes up to this little antenna on top of your house and then you go, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. So. Well, is that where you wanted to talk about this uh, paper that had to do with Maxwell's demon? <clears throat> Uh, if, if you want to go there, you know, the, the math is, is the, the elephant in the room. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted to tackle that one or not. Well, is, it's not something that you, is it something you can talk about without actually bringing up the paper? I mean, can you talk about it peripherally? Because well, um, I think the, the point of it, right, is that you wanted to talk about the difference between functional information and formal information. Right. And I know yeah, Perry was, believes very much that that language is very critical to this whole issue of code. So I know that's one thing I, I've noticed in your conversations. You use the word code, whereas most people will be talking information just as a comparison. And I, I thought, OK. Information is just it's not it's not defined at least in, in physics there's at least three definitions mm -hmm. for what information is and depending on which one you pick you're going to end up with different mathematics so it's always one of the fuzzy things that leaves me unsatisfied and when you start using the word code i think okay you understand that there's forms of information that it has to take on you know and i say code is information that's been instantiated into something physical it can now be shared processed transmitted exchanged read written in the yeah. sense yeah you, yeah you can't go down to the feed store and get a 20 pound sack of information exactly exactly yeah. and i i learned this the hard way because i spent several years in discussion boards in the blogosphere debating people who didn't want <laughs> didn't even want to understand what i was saying and um and you had to nail down the terms with absolute crystal clarity so what a lot of people don't realize is that 
the origin of the $10 million prize really started in the Infidels discussion board in 2005. Mm -hmm. I had given a talk called, if you can read this, I can prove God exists. And uh, I gave that talk at a, at a mega church and it, it was a recording on my website and tens of thousands of people heard that talk. And the argument was DNA is a code. All the other codes are designed, therefore DNA is designed. And uh, I got into an argument with somebody about this on email and uh, I was backing him into a corner and, and then he, he messages me back and he goes, Hey, I posted a link to your talk uh, on this discussion board. Uh, you might want to go look at this in on, on the world's largest atheist discussion board. He said, Hey, I've been talking to this guy, Perry, here's his talk. Um, be nice to him while you rip him to shreds. And I'm like, oh, great. Uh, this is going to be fun. Um, and so it was one of me and like 50 a, of them. And this went on for seven years. It became the world's, the, the longest running, most viewed thread on the entire board. And every time there'd be a new post, it'd go right back up to the top. And, um, and so if, if you were just talking about, if you said, uh, well, only living things or humans create information, uh, they'd go, well, I'm looking at the sun right now and that's information or, or, you know, the, the ripples in the water in the, in the puddle are information. And the definitions were so vague that nobody could agree about what we were really talking about. And so I said, code is symbolic information exchanged between a sender and a receiver or an encoder and a decoder. And it's a digital communication system, just like in Claude Shannon's paper. And that's what, it, that's what I mean by information and that's code. And none of those exist outside of the living world. Show me an example. If you disagree, show me one. All you need is one. Show me a, a communication system that didn't come from a human or a living thing. And they never could find one. And I meticulously tweaked the language, the arguments, every single word of that specification has been slaved over. And it is the way it is for very precise reasons. And in fact, What's funny about that whole atheist discussion board is those people scrutinized my definitions more carefully than any scientist I've ever worked with since. Because they were, their very identity was on the line as atheists. Mm -hmm. and, and they were mad. I mean, they were, they were spitting nails mad that some creationist had backed them into a corner and held them there for seven years and they, and they couldn't budge. And, uh, and so I dialed that in precisely. I practiced this on hundreds and hundreds of conversation with hundreds and hundreds of people. And so it's been very, very carefully worded and defined. And I think it is the most uh, it's the deepest question in science that can be precisely defined. I think there are other questions that are harder to define, like, well, where did the Big Bang come from? Or, or where did the fine tuning of the universe come from? And th there's questions like that, which are, you don't even know how to wrap your head around them. But we can very precisely define this. And so we, we need an answer. And the fact that we don't means that we are in an age of science that as soon as this is figured out, we will be in a new age. It, like it'll be a completely new world once that's figured out. Yeah, so I noticed, you know, my physics background, I, I saw what you did with the challenge. And there's it's pretty subtle. And I'm not sure a lot of people really see the depth there. That's, that's a physics question that will get you a Nobel Prize if you can answer it. And I, I suspect the patents that come out of it will be worth billions. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had people say $10 million isn't near enough for that. And I say, no, it's not. It's just a start. And that's why the person that discovers it will be partnered into the company and become a shareholder. 
because this could be worth billions. I mean, this is bigger than the transistor. It's bigger than nuclear power. It's bigger than e equals MC squared. Um, and it, it could be the secret of life. And for that matter, um, it's probably really scary. Is, is nuclear power scary? Absolutely. Um, but it's also can do a lot of good things. And so one of the things that I've had to realize is that this is the price of progress is you take risks of discovering new things and you have to face it boldly instead of being afraid of it. Well, I think I can go off a, a couple of different directions on this one. And uh, in the origins of life, it gets into a, a, a funny direction that, well, just anecdotally what I've noticed in the physics realm, the physicists who are atheists, not necessarily militant, are also against theories of everything and things like strong emergence. And so there's more than just uh, a reluctance to go down the religion route. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to accept the fact that there's a theory of everything of which all the, the numbers come out just right, all the constants just happen, and so, I'm, you know, I can't prove it, but there's a similarity. There, there's a correlation there. And I've noticed a lot on the materialist side. I know you kind of touched on this already, that they believe that you can get humanity out of science, but they don't actually do it. I've yet to see someone who advocates for spontaneous evolution actually dive in. It's like, hey, where did it start? What's the... You know, answer your question. If you are a materialist and you really believe that science can have the answers, I figured they would be diving all over your challenge question. And I don't see that at all. <laughs> and what I'm just throwing out to you, because you might be the only person who could understand this, but it's like the science versus religion is actually a proxy battle for something deeper that might be a question like what does it mean to be human in the first place or i'm just throwing that out as a possibility but have you ever thought about that because you know before i answer that i would like you to elaborate more it i, I sense that you're really onto something here but I want to make sure we really have this out on the table. T take another run at that. Uh, well, on the math side, I, I noticed in your paper, you quote, biological systems are the only ones that uh, exhibit agency. Mm -hmm. And across the board, everyone seems to agree with that. But the paper, short paper I'm pointing to, it says no. Phys agency is already in physics. Maxwell's demon has agency. And the centers and receivers in Shannon's theory are entities with agency. And most importantly, the observers, you know, Alice and Bob in quantum mechanics are entities with agency. It's already there, but no one wants to touch it in, in the realm of physics. It's and I think that's, you know, I'm not asking you to accept it, but I'm just throwing it out there. That seems to be the forbidden zone. No one wants to cross over into and say, okay, what is agency? If you grant the Maxwell's demon agency, then you're going to have to explain it using the laws of physics and, uh, and mathematics alone. And that gets into the question, everyone rejects I think almost across the board that mathematics is sufficient to address origins of life questions like intelligence, consciousness. And so if you, the language of physics is mathematics. So if mathematics is not capable of expressing those ideas, then it seems like law of unintended consequences, you just shut the door on physics and chemistry as ever being a source of a solution 
In fact, even adding rules to discoveries to physics, which will all be mathematical, will, will not be useful. And so now I, I think if you reject math in such a categorical fashion, you are back to either an outside intelligent agent, which is not physical, poking the laws of physics at moments, or something like panpsychism, where you just fold it in as like a, a secret sauce, or you know. And I think that's what people don't want to go. They don't want to buy the math, and I think they're afraid of it. That somehow, if you buy the math, you're going to lose your humanity. And my suggestion is no. Um, Math is Alice in Wonderland. If you cross over that border, you'll end up in a place which is more bizarre than anything you can imagine. Possibilities you, that you can dream of. Well, I think we're pretty close in the way we see things, if, if I'm hearing you right. So let's talk about Maxwell's demons. So just, just for the sake of people that might not be familiar uh, let, let me explain how I was taught Maxwell's demon, and, and I'm going to ask you to maybe flesh it out a little more. So mm -hmm. uh, Maxwell's demon is uh, James Clerk Maxwell in the 1800s. He said, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, hot things tend to get cold and heat tends to spread out. Um, but what if uh, on my refrigerator, I had a tiny little door and I had a tiny little guy who opens the door. And every time a hot molecule inside the refrigerator comes, comes nearby, he's going to open it and let it out. And every time a cold molecule from outside comes by, he's going to let it in. And just by opening that little door, the refrigerator will stay cold and the outside will stay hot. Um, and, uh, and then somebody figured out, well, that's nice, but you still can't cheat because it takes a certain amount of energy to detect what those molecules are doing before they hit the refrigerator door. And, and so, and the, the detection of the information still consumes energy. So there's still no free lunch. So you, you still can't violate the laws of thermodynamics, even if you have a magical little guy. Um, and so now people talk about Maxwell's demon all the time in physics and thermodynamics because it helps you conceptualize um, knowledge of the states of matter. And it reinforces that there's no getting around the laws of, of, of thermodynamics. Now, what I would like you to clarify is that um, that mostly when I hear people talking about Maxwell Demon, they're talking about a theoretical construct, but you seem to be going a step farther in saying that people acknowledge that that's, this actually does physically exist, but, but I'm not sure if that's what you want to say or not. Uh, yes, more on, on the measurement by the photon, they've they've dealt with that. That's not an issue. Yeah. So, yeah, um, it turns out that whatever mechanism that you come up with to to decipher what's coming and going, there are physics workarounds that kind of cancel those arguments. The Maxwell's demon has been recast in a form called Zillard's engine. Have you seen that one? I could find it for you. I've of, heard of it. Yeah, instead of a box of with a barrier and, and Avogadro's number of particles, it's a cylinder and a piston and one particle. Hmm. So it's it's in the you know the the vein of assume a spherical cow that physicists always do. You reduce it down to the simplest problem you can. So you have one molecule in a box with a piston. And so that reduces the whole problem down and you, you find that you can you know, make equivalents of, of this with uh, wells and, and potential wells and stuff. There's a lot of games you can play that all the 
excuses you come up with to explain why Maxwell's demon should have problems, you can find workarounds. And so it was still sitting there. And Landauer, uh, Rolf Landauer came along. I'm sure you've heard of his name. Um, yeah. The Racer Principle. And he recast Maxwell's demon in, in terms of computation. And essentially said, every time the process cycles, the Zillard's engine cycles, you know, they, they let the piston expand and then you move the piston back. There's a point when you have to reset the system and erase memory. And when you erase a, a bit of memory, um, that changes the entropy of the universe. And that's where you're, um, where it's going out. And so they solve the problem, they think, in terms of entropy and that one bit. So information now becomes physical. And that's where the phrase came from uh, out of Landauer's work. But it's really subtle and it's hard for me to sit down and explain. See, I have to sit and just quietly think through it when I work with it myself. So that's where I've started to see thermodynamics and computation, a choice being made and bits of memory stored and unstored. And there's uh, energy loss in just the process. Um, I think Landauer's first instantiation of it was noticing that if you have something like an AND gate or an OR gate, it's two inputs and one output. And, but once you've done the logical operation, you lose the information of what was before. You had two bits of information, but the output is now one bit. So you've lost because you can't, it's, it's an irreversible process. And so you can start casting logical operations in terms of thermodynamics and irreversibility. And that's kind of the, the entryway to the thermodynamics problem. So now, I've lost my, well, my, my train. Well, Glenn, my interpretation of Maxwell's demon is that you still have to insert agency at the point where you decide where's the inside of the refrigerator and where's the outside of the refrigerator. Right, and so- He, he what still this, has to decide which way he wants the energy to go. Right. And that's a choice. So, yeah, what this paper's pointing out, and- I've noticed there's a lot of Maxwell's demons have been created experimentally. And so people say, well, see, you can do it, but they're all autonomous. They've all been engineered to work that way. And in when the ones I've looked at, what they, they reduce down to what you would call a relaxation oscillator. There's no intelligence going on if you pull back to the old electronics days. It's, a, it's an oscillator that just waits until a threshold is passed and then it does, and then a threshold and then passes. Because they will have they have transistors now that can switch one electron at a time. And so they have, you know, engineered systems that can just let one electron go through between two barriers. And, but none of those have agency. And what they're pointing out is the original um, encapsulation of the Maxwell's demon was it was intelligent and it had free will to make choices. And you can't program something like that. That's the thesis of this short paper that really set me off thinking about it. Said so something like that has to learn and grow on its own. Mm -hmm. So the true Maxwell's demon, if you Imagine it as it really is theoretically imagined originally, not as you create it experimentally, as autonomous uh, patterns on lithography someplace. It has to learn, it has to grow and accumulate its knowledge somehow. And so they took Maxwell's demon and applied population dynamics to it. Because you know, this points out, well, the demon can just as equally undo everything as well as create it. So I think it, it, that's what's got me thinking. It's not an answer, but it, it's a, a way of looking at the problem that suggests that the demon, if it exists physically, will have to be, have some way of learning and growing and acquiring 
code know what to do by experience. And if you think about that, no one in physics wants to talk about, well, at least I haven't seen anyone try it, to explain how the demon would acquire its knowledge. So I see an echo of your problem there. Well, I think if you look at a cell, even the simplest cell, in ter terms of like, what is it let in and what does it let out? It's behaving as a Maxwell's demon and it's yeah. maintaining homeostasis. And there are ion channels and is it gonna let the ions in and out? And there are gap junctions. And if you, ex uh, one way that I like to think about it is, um, uh, one of my friends, John Torday, uh, has written a lot of papers and he's talking, talk about, uh, I, th I think he calls it a micelle, M-I-C-E-L-L-E, as a just lipids in a spherical, a spherical ball of lipids. And, um, and he, he thinks, he thinks the first cell was, um, uh, I don't want to butcher his theory. Um, so maybe people should look, look it up and, and, and read it from the source. But um, the, you have an inside and an outside. And for it to maintain homeostasis, it has to decide what to let in and what to let out. So let's just extend it one further. What if the creation of a genetic code is the way that it chooses to keep a record of what's happened before and that the genetic code is a second step after a unit of agency already exists. Well, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it's more consistent mm -hmm. with my observations and understandings of how agency works and how information works then it is a, a lucky RNA strand and it started replicating and then somehow or another it turned into a cell. I found that story to have way too missing steps for me to find plausible. And it, and it never even explains where the code came from in the first place. It just assumes that if, if you had physical RNA strands, information or in genetic code would just eventually emerge. Better. Yeah, that's that can't happen. There has to be a set of a bootstrapping mechanism of some sort. You know, again, as a hardware guy, you you present me with a problem, and I say, okay, there's got to be steps. There's got to be a sequence of pieces of hardware that make it work. And if you go into there with that attitude, then you you can't just say, well, that can't happen. You have to go, okay, there has to be something there. So what can it be? And, you know, maybe the Sherlock Holmes thing, you know, once you've eliminated all the, the, the possible, the only thing left is the impossible or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you just take a leap of faith. So I don't know if it'll work, but I want to try. So I think physics is where the concept of agency needs to start. And whatever agency is has to begin there. And there is no theory or comprehensive notion within physics itself what agency is. And if you don't have it there, then you're not going to get it in chemistry or anywhere else up the line either. So I think the analogy I've used is agency is like in yeast. When you're baking bread, you got to put it in right at the beginning with your ingredients before you do anything else. You can't put it in halfway through the, the bread making process. Well, so Glenn, when you're talking about agency, you're basically just talking about choice, right? Yes. And I, I, I understand you may be a little bit reluctant to use that word when you're talking yeah. about something pre-life because we had one very famous episode on here, Perry, where Glenn was speaking with another guy about physics, and that guy was radically non-agentic <laughs> in anything outside of life. 
Yeah. And he just ripped Glenn up one side and down the other because of this idea that there could be such a thing as choice. But I, in your book, you make the statement that information capacity is a capacity for choice. Yes. Each bit is the freedom to select a one or a zero. Mm-hmm. And and I wondered when you said that, are you also talking about non-living things when you say that? Well, when when you have information the in the form of code, like we were talking about earlier, um, that information is a record of choices that have been made in the past. And so if I have a digital thermometer and the thermometer is dumping, you know, it's taking a temperature every minute and putting it on a hard drive, you might say, well, there's no choices going on there. That's just the laws of physics. And that's true from one point of view, but there was still a choice as to that, whether it's going to be recorded every minute or every 30 seconds or every hour, there's still a choice of all of the data formats in which, like how was, what format is the temperature reported in? What, what kind of bits or bytes did we use? What kind of hardware did we use? What kind of software did we use? Is it Celsius or Fahrenheit or Kelvin? There's a whole bunch of choices and there's no getting around them. Mm-hmm. And so um, in biology, we have choices. In physics, physics has no conception of choices. They don't even exist in physics proper. And what Glenn is saying is, well, they must exist somewhere because biology works and biology is made out of physics. Um, and uh, And Glenn asks the question, well, if information is metaphysical, there must be some way in which it becomes physical. I've got an old friend, Bill Jenkins. He's an electrical engineer. The way he puts it is, what's God's transducer? <laughs> you know, what is what is the way in which some metaphysical abstract idea becomes um gets into a physical system, which I I think is a very fundamental question. It's like, well, where did Mozart get all his ideas from? You know, most creative people throughout history have believed and said and reported and described how things just come to them. Mm -hmm. J.K. Rowling was sitting on a stalled train And the whole idea of Harry Potter came to her as this big giant three hour download. She was scribbling in her notebook as fast as she could write. I mean, this is the most, this is the best selling books in history. Yeah. So this is, this is a physicist has no idea what to do with it, but people in the arts have been talking about it for all of recorded history. And we've all experienced it. It's not like we don't know what this is like. So the question is, can you distill it down, bottle it, and then apply it at the level of chemistry? Yes. And And I I think we should be able to, it should be solvable. It's probably right under our nose. Well, that's what I believe at this point in my life. But I just wanted to throw a footnote in or a little tangent. You know, Mozart might have heard his symphonies all at one time, but I think as an engineer, I'm more in the, you know, Karen's, um, I get a bit of an inspiration and then I start working at it. And then gradually, stochastically, it tells me what it wants to be. And it, then it starts to take form. And I've told people that when I'm designing something in electronics or a PC board, it's like it almost tells you what it wants to be. You start, you know, specking parts and 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 everything, and, and it just there's one way it wants to fit together. Yeah. And then that's when it comes together. Yes, musicians know this. Musicians know, you know, somebody writes a ballad, and if if they go get some other band members to help play it for the first time, if they say 
let the song be what it wants to be. Everybody knows what they're talking about. And everybody knows that you don't put a big drum solo in the middle of the ballad, that that's going to that's gonna mess it up. And, and this iterative process that you're talking about, one of the subtleties of J.K. Rowling's story is, even though like the whole idea and the characters and everything kind of came all at once, it still took her seven years to like iron out all the kinks in the story. Mm-hmm. Kind of like, um, almost like uh, you ever take a, can- uh, a, a tin foil wrapper on a chocolate bar and after you started eating the chocolate, you take your finger or your pencil eraser and you start smoothing out the wrinkles in the wrapper because it's you know kind of fun to play with the tinfoil i think that's what she had to do mm-hmm. with this story and it, in a sense it came all at once but the details were not clear she had a sense of what it needed to be but it still took her years to do all the edits and then now you have again this is this is the, what the creative process seems to be for writers, engineers, musicians, physicists, hardware designers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so going, continuing on that, and back to your, your Shannon, um, your prize challenge, the way I've learned to distinguish um, between analog and digital over the years, because usually people say analog is just continuous and digital is, is discrete, but that's not necessarily true. There are discrete analog circuits and digital circuits, if you push them high enough in frequency are completely analog. Hmm. Um, an analog circuit is one in which the intermediate variables are continuous functions of the input and output. A digital circuit is one in which the intermediate variables are symbolic hmm. representations of the input and output output yes variables and so i think this where i'm starting to see your challenge is that the sender and receiver when you you specify they have to be symbolic it doesn't necessarily have to be digital you know because we can have different frequency shift phase shift module there's lots of ways to modulate a signal to send symbolic information besides just one and zero but it's the fact that it, the information being transmitted is symbolic means that the sender and receiver are agents, have agency, because otherwise the symbolic nature of the data wouldn't matter. And I think that's what that short paper is pointing out to is Maxwell's demon lives on symbolic information, not what he would call, he called functional versus formal, which is just bits and bytes. Ones and zeros don't matter to an agent. It's the, what the ones and zeros represent symbolically. So I'm thinking of, you know, what was it? Big blue walks can swim. Your center says, ask questions, you know, four questions. And you get yes, no, yes, no, one, zero, one, zero. The receiver gets one, zero and says, oh, it has, has to have the same list. The sender and the receiver have to have the same list of questions so that when the symbolic data goes across, the symbolic receiver knows what they're getting. So then they then it, the conversion is the ones and zeros go back to yes, big, not blue, can walk, can't swim. That is what this paper refers to as formal information. And that's what Landauer's principle applies to. And that's what agents live on is the functional information, not the bits and bytes. And I think a lot of the discussions through my dynamics, and I see it so often in the papers, get down to the ones and zeros and the thermodynamics of Shannon information just as a formal mathematical statement mm-hmm. and miss the fact that it's it's agency, something going on. But then that the trick, I think, is where does that information come from? Well, there must be something that the sender is looking at and the receiver is passing on to. So the fact that your example implies a much bigger 
uh, flow backwards, outward from that one point. So I think it's a much bigger um, holistic question than, than you just might see in the, the question. The fact that the sender is sending symbolic information means the sender has agency, which means it's doing something in reaction to its outside environment. And its outside environment might be other agents or just might be physics of falling rocks and landslides or something. So you can't, you know, as a physicist, I'm looking at this, yeah, you can't just do this in isolation because the sender and receiver are still interacting with something else outside. And that outside has to be somehow included into the, the metaphysics of the whole mess. Does, it, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so that's why if you look at Shannon's paper, the encoder always has an input. Like yeah. there, there was something upstream. And I think Shannon was very wise in not trying to have a philosophical discussion about what's upstream. Uh, he, he limited it to just what could be mathematically analyzed. Now, when, when I was in the infidels forum, one of the things that I realized was I think I'm going to be in trouble if somebody tries to give me an analog system and tells me that it was encoded and decoded, but they haven't thought of that yet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they're going to think of it sooner or later. And, and I, I don't know what I'm going to do when they bring that up. But before they managed to bring it up, I realized well, the reason that what I'm looking for needs to be digital and not analog is because the genetic code is digital, not analog. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to stipulate this is digital. So I'm only dealing with the digital side of Shannon's theory instead of the analog side. And then, you know, because we're trying to solve life, we're not trying to solve like some other kind of a problem. And, and so, um, yeah, there, there are very deep philosophical problems in this and they manifest themselves in a bunch of different but equivalent ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Shannon's theory quantifies information, but it is unable to deal with meaning at exactly. all. Exactly, yeah. Okay, well, that has an equivalent in mathematics, which is that in, in uh, Turing in computation, which is that any, any mathematical function or any computer program is a turn the crank where all you have to do is turn the crank and, and answers will come out. I, I can have f of x and if you know, I run x from zero to infinity, I'll get y. But what you can't compute is axioms. In, math, in, in mathematics, axioms produce the formulas, the formulas do not tell you the axioms. And this is really mathematics 101. I mean, it's the absolute foundation of mathematics, but it turns out even in math, stipulating a set of ax axioms is an act of choice. It's an act of volition, which brings you once again back to Maxwell's demon. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to express this, but they're all the same problem. What is choice and where does it come from? Um, Dennis Noble, my prize judge and longtime uh, friend and colleague, um, he points out that the, the neo-Darwinists like Jerry Coyne um, are married to a form of determinism that's just like Calvinism from the religious um, people. Uh, yeah. that, that the genes... Like Jerry Coyne believes that you and I just have this illusion that we're making choices, but our genes and the laws of physics are just blindly driving us forward and that the, our sense of choice is the greatest illusion in history. 
In other words, we're living in the matrix. Right, right. But, but what's funny is none of these people actually act like this is true. Jerry acts like he writes a blog post and wants people to decide to believe it. Or well, that yeah, that's that's the challenge. You you in physics there's a concept that they call free choice. And it, it's in quantum mechanics, you know, it's a classic like the observer has free choice to pick what experiment they're going to do or observation to do. And that's one of the undecided questions when you have that double slit or whatever experiment you want to do or uh, Wheeler's um, delayed choice experiment. That's the, that's the classic one. If the, the observer decides after the particle has gone through the slit, whether it's going to measure the particle or, or, or the wave. And the question is, does the observer have free choice to decide what experiment or observation you're going to do? And that's that's where it shows up. Does it, and um, the way out of it is one super determinism, and that is of what observation to make has already been determined at the Big Bang. And then essentially, if you believe that, then you're living in the matrix. You know, it's, it's kind of a bistable state. You, you either pick one or the other. And you're choosing a form of intelligent design when you do that. You know, Paul Davies um, said, if, if you believe that, um, that everything is baked in deterministically, um, from the very beginning, then every single day that the world progresses further and somebody invents another airplane and every time there's another um, breakthrough or whatever, um, the, the degree of fine tuning required for the universe to have reached that state just goes up and up and up and up. And which neither he nor I sees as an acceptable way of answering the problem. Well, I say that's a very boring universe for God to make. Well, well, yeah, and so and so, I I just came to the conclusion that I I had to accept the red pill that there is some kind of a gift in the universe that we call agency that. Um, we are endowed with the ability to choose and that it is not an illusion that is really real. Um, and, and that the universe is not predetermined from the word go. Um, and that makes much more sense of what humans actually do and how they want to be treated. Like if, if you, if you start treating your coworkers, like they don't really have choices and they're just automatons, mm -hmm and you talk to them as though they are that, they will get really irritated with you really fast. Well, you know, I guess I guess you really couldn't have done any differently because, well, you came from a dysfunctional family. Like, if you said something like that, that's an insult. Most of us consider it an insult, but not in academia. <laughs> My wife teaches If, I, if I could throw something in here real quick, um, what you just said, Perry, is a question that Michael Levin addressed the other day. Well, I think it actually was in his conversation with John Verbeke on my channel, and I was re-listening to it. Um, he was saying that while, if the laws of physics imply that there is no choice, that that everything is determined by by the past moment, you know, into this moment, then that gets rid of. Um, any sort of prosecution in any criminal activity, right? Yes. But, but what what Michael Levin says solves the problem, I think this is what he says solves the problem, is time. That in any given moment, your choices are determined by past actions, past attitudes, past, past habits, past behaviors. But over a series of time, there you have some sort of opportunity to 
change to transform to you know to exercise or to get eat better or to make better moral choices or whatever and that over time then so so then when you in a court of law and they say you did this and you're guilty and you say well but I, at that moment I couldn't have done anything else the judge can say yes at that moment you couldn't have done anything else but all the years leading up to it mm -hmm. okay but that seems to me like we're just still just kicking the can down the road backwards because there's any of those choices made in the past that affect the present are still choices. So try this on for size. If I have a bucket of rocks, time acts on the rocks. The rocks do not act on time. But if I have any kind of sentient being Sentient beings have an awareness of time and they act on time before it arrives. We think about the future. Okay, so let's, let's give you a gruesome example. If, if somebody's having a really, really bad day and they get drunk, and then they leave the bar and they kill a pedestrian while they're drunk. They certainly didn't have time to swerve the car a hundred milliseconds before it hit the person. It was too late. But they did have time four hours ago to not get drunk. Okay, which is ex it's almost exactly what's being said here. But you have to acknowledge the difference between an agent who thinks about the future and a rock that, as far as we know, does not think about the future. Time acts on the rock, but an agent acts on time because an agent knows, like we all know that 2023 is coming before it comes. And, be, and because agents can act on the future, we expect our fellow human beings to do that. And that's why we have courts and laws. Mm -hmm. Dennis Noble made the exact same argument. Um, there's a video where he talks about, he's talking to a bunch of Oxford students. And he says, he says, if you take the selfish gene theory enough, seriously enough, a person is going to go before a judge and say, well, yes, I did kill those 12 people, but my selfish genes, uh, program me to do that so I didn't have any choice therefore I shouldn't go to jail and he said no sane judge in any country I know of would accept that as an argument but if you really 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 accepted the selfish gene as being the truth then you would so what kind of society do we want are we really going to believe that mm -hmm. well we don't act as if we believe it no we don't but there are, there are people who want us to act that way. If you go listen to an unbelievable Justin Brierley podcast uh, a few years ago, they had a debate between atheists who don't believe in free will and other people who do. And the atheists who didn't believe in free will thought that we should get rid of our penal system and be more forgiving. That's what they said. Go listen to it. Yeah, or this just sort of begs the question, where does forgiveness yeah. come from? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Capital punishment. If you can't control yourself, then you're gone. That's the, the alter, alternate choice mm -hmm. that logically comes out of that as well. Right. So. Right. So, um, so these are, it's, I just think it's fascinating how these very, very technical questions in biology take us directly to the most pervasive philosophical questions of all time. Mm -hmm. It's like, they're no different. The Greeks were talking about this stuff 2,500 years ago. So can I pull it back to, to choice? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, on, on the notion of, of free choice, because if you look at it, it's starting from the observer in quantum mechanics. 
what free choice in one sense, one way to define it is that the choice is not uniquely determined by the past history of the universe. Another way to say it is that a choice is a, a point when there is multiple pathways into the future now, mm -hmm. which are all still consistent with the past history of the universe. There's, there's, there's a fork in the road. Now, if you look at quantum mechanics in terms of like particle decay, we can, there'll be, we can't predict how a particle might decay. We can predict probabilities, but we can't say which, which choice into the future it's going to take. But an agent in its most fundamental sense is an entity which is capable of picking by a set of rules or by some means, a unique path into the future. Of the of the several that are available at, the, at some joint uh, juncture in time and space. So, um, I think essence. If you want to push choice back down to the level of physics, you have to acknowledge that there are multiple pathways into the future, mm -hmm. multiple futures which are all consistent with the past history of the universe up to that point. So you can't have perfect determinism and have choice. Choice breaks that. And you have the option now of picking one of those paths forward. So, I think in the most crude sense, an agent is an entity that can exercise that aspect of the laws of, of, of physics, the aspect of our universe. That's a toughie. Well, I think it's very fascinating that In, it seems like you can define an agent as an entity that can be an observer in a double slit experiment. They, or the observers are agents. Right. And since yeah. there is no theory of what an observer is in physics, um, that's the challenge. Right. So I so think we do. This, this is striking at that question. Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at is that your your prize challenge question is a very deep one. It goes all the way down to the fundamentals of physics. Yeah. We have we have three episodes on the observer as well. So Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> We've talked about it very deeply. Well, so I'd like to bring something up. I, I have been wondering this and asking people from time to time about it. So has anybody done an experiment to show whether a dog can be an observer, a cat can be an observer, a cockroach can be an observer, a fish could be an observer, or an algae can be an observer in a double sled experiment the way that a human can? I even heard once that a particle can be an observer. Isn't that right, Glenn? What's uh, well, the detectors are the observers. That's that's the big question who is the observer because you know either it's a it's a it's a particle on a on a photographic film or it's a, a scintillator detector or it's, there's some electronic or optic or chemical event record from that photon being measured so that is that the observer or is the observer we asked yeah, so we talked about it in, in one of the talks is or is the observer the computer program that records it on the hard drive? Or is the observer the grad student that opens up the Excel spreadsheet and looks at it for the first time? Mm -hmm. That's not answered. There is no answer to that in physics. <laughs> you, you would think by now there would be. OK, so Glenn, I've got, uh, there's a video in a podcast that I did a few years ago with Sam Bart called Ways to Solve the Evolution 2.0 Prize. And we go through a whole list of rocks that I think people should turn over more that, that yes, might seen lead it. to an answer. And I think this one right here is one of them. What is the observer? Can we come up with an experiment where the dog is the observer, where a mouse is the observer, where a paramecium is an observer, where a goldfish is an observer. 
how far down can we go? My hypothesis is that anything at a cell level and above can be an observer and that there is something fundamentally different in biology and that we could use that experiment to prove that cells are conscious. Now, that's just my hypothesis. I don't know. But, but I, I think pursuing that question harder is a very, very productive line of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, you just, one of the problems I think is so much of the origins of life terminology, vocabulary comes from biology, comes from us, philosophy, theology. But if these questions are going to become physics questions, they have to be reframed and given definitions which have a mathematical form that you can crunch. And that, I think that's where, that's the wall that everybody hits because so my, one of my suggestions, I'm trying, I'm not a, an apostle on this, but replace the word consciousness with the word agency. And then say, consciousness is how we experience this phenomena of agency. And so it, it can take us out of the, the theoretical development pathway. That seems so would, fine to me. Okay. That's one of the things I've noticed is that reluctance to recast definitions into formal mathematical statements. And then it's kind of like, well, that's not what I mean by consciousness, or that's not what I mean by, and then you hit a wall. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's fine. But what I've noticed is people aren't content to just let you go off and do that. They almost have to fight you on it. And I think the thing that sparked me was Stuart Kaufman's paper. Mm. Yeah, where he's arguing that set theory can't be useful. And I'm thinking, well, my God, set theory is like the core of just about all of abstract mathematics. So that seemed to be a bit incredulous statement for him to make, but- um, Hang on, uh, I want you to elaborate. I wanna make sure I'm tracking with you. Can you explain that more? Um, he was talking about set theory not being able to address questions, I think, in, of, that you would come up with in origins of life issues, that set theory is not adequate to deal with the problem. Right. But as someone who's been trained mathematically, it's like, no, well, set theory is everywhere. Uh, so you can't even do physics without set theory. So I thought... Okay, he, he, but, he's... I've talked to him about this. I know. That's why one of the things I, I listened to your podcast and then I, I was looking at his paper too. Well, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with set theory, but what, what he says in his paper is there is no mechanical process for making a list of all of the things that you could do with an engine block. Okay, so he said, what could you do with an engine block? Uh, you could make an engine out of it, but you could also use it as a paperweight. You could also use it to crack open a coconut. Uh, and that's what an affordance is. Like a, a living thing will take an engine block and figure out an infinite number of crazy, interesting things that you could do with mm -hmm. it. What he says about set theory is there is no ordered mechanical process for making the list of all of the things that you could do with the engine block. And, um, and that is equivalent to, uh, I think, to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, mm -hmm. where, um, where it is, it is not, th there, there are statements that are true about a system that the system does not have the ability to make. Right. And so it's really it's really just an equivalent of the incompleteness problem or, or Turing's halting problem. There are things that you cannot know mathematically, therefore it requires choice. So all Stu is saying is, is I have to choose a set. There's not a mechanical process for the set choosing itself. Therefore, agency is real. That's what I understand Stu to be saying. Is there something I'm missing in that? 
I'm not sure. Um, for some reason, it, it rubbed me the wrong way. And I'm not sure where I can put my finger on exactly what um, I would object to. But uh, because I'm working in a comp theory of computation and game theory, it's all based on set theory. So if he's not making a general statement that set theory is inadequate for studying consciousness, then he should have, I feel that he should have qualified it more explicitly. But certain aspects, you know, I, you know, I agree you can't enumerate all of the things that exist in Plato's realm of the forms. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see that as an argument against a machine that might enumerate possibilities. Uh, oh, well, oh, well, well, I don't see. I don't think he's saying that you can't have a machine that enumerates possibilities, but really he's saying the exact same thing that I'm saying in my paper, which is that biology cannot be reduced to mathematics. Now, I, I didn't say it very explicitly, or I, I didn't belabor the point, but yeah but 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 if you define science as reducing the universe to mathematical laws then science by that definition will never figure out biology or consciousness or agency or what it means to be human which goes back to something that you were talking about at the very beginning like i don't think this can be reduced to mathematics and that is like that is like a a Copernican shift in science mm -hmm. for that to be accepted. Okay, yeah, I, I think where it doesn't work with me as is being trained as a physicist. I use mathematics all the time, and so if you say you can't bring it down to mathematics, it's kind of like, well, you can't. You know, my, my tool set out in the garage can't design, a, you know, a car. But it's like, well, no, but I do, and I use those tools. Right. So in some sense, mathematics is the tool set. Right. And physics is like, you know, the mechanic. And I feel like, okay, when you're saying it's not reducible down to mathematics, are you saying that it's not reducible down to a tool set? But that's the tools that I use to do the work. Um, well, we'll try this on for size. You can't even reduce math. Oh, sorry. You can't even reduce mathematics to mathematics. No, at some point you take it as 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 a given. Yeah, there's a certain level where you just have to make an assumption. Okay, this is what we have to work with. And right. We work up from there. Right. And. Uh, if you try and go, you know, axioms, where do axioms come from? Well, experience, uh, they seem to work. Uh, that's what heuristic arguments are good for. That heuristic arguments are not logical arguments, but they are, there are ways that we take specifics and turn into general statements. Right. You know, I, I think that you, people sometimes use the word induction, I think, for that term. Mm -hmm. But we, we make good guesses and then we try and we formulate a rule based on experience. And then that becomes an axiom. But that axiom is always subject to revision down the road as we experiment and try it out. Well, so when, when we do heuristics, what we're really doing is we're stringing a bunch of non sequiturs together that make adequate sense based on our experience. And we usually get an outcome that is good enough and it's not perfect and it's not formalized and it's not, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not any of those mathematical ideals, but every single creature on earth that's still alive and functioning is managing to do it. And so right. I think that that, that means that inductive reasoning is a much greater skill set than deductive reasoning and calculation. Mm -hmm. 
And so oh, it's, yeah. it's not, it doesn't invalidate mathematics, but it just says there, it has a limited role. It's not an ultimate reality. Okay. I'll just, I'll just let it go. I'm struggling on this one. Well, it's well, worth that, can, Let me throw something in here um, that I was thinking about in this uh, whole idea about scientific materialism's insistence upon bifurcating nature into primary quantitative and secondary qualitative characteristics, mm. which I think is a quote from Goethe, or it might be a quote from Wolfgang Smith. I'm not sure. I've got a bunch of notes here. But I was thinking about that. Well, maybe there's no need to bifurcate between primary quantitative and secondary qualitative characteristics because maybe there is a way that quantitative and quantitative and qualitative inform each other through proportional relationships. That's the way I think about it in art, for sure, that they inform each other. But I know you have a hard stop at 9.30 at my I, time, Perry. So I'm, I need we need to bail out at this point. But I think there's much more to be talked about. So if you would be interested in coming back again, we'd love well, to have you. I would. And I want to compliment you, Glenn, because you've reached into the depth of these questions a lot deeper than most people that I talk to. Um, most people they'll appreciate this from maybe one particular discipline that they're in, but they don't usually see how, how many things get pulled into this question and how deep this really is. And like, these are the real questions. Like, I think you could take any one of five or six rabbit trails that we were on today and you could go very deep like that, that whole question of, so like, the buck stops at the real observer. Where is the real observer in physics? That is a that is a billion dollar question right there. It's the Nobel and, Prize question if you can answer it. Absolutely, and and I think it it it's I would add that to the like if I was going to do a part two of ways to solve the evolution prize. I would go right there. In fact, I I think I did refer to it, but I didn't go very far into mm -hmm. it. But these are great questions and, and I, I want to applaud you because as both a physicist and a product designer and somebody who's, you know, designing devices that have inputs and outputs and programs and, you know, medical equipment and all of that, um, you have an appreciation for this stuff that not a lot of people have. So this has been a great conversation. Yes, it's been actually amazing for me. So. And a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, I've really never talked to anybody before, except for Karen. All right. So it's been a wonderful conversation. And I'm just an innocent observer. So. But you're an observer, and we know that. <laughs> observer, yes. And you're an agent. Thank you both so much, and uh, I hope we can continue the conversation. Let's do that. All you right. Have a great day. Okay. okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.